Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter, and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where you are and what time it is. Uh, this is a worldwide ministry. We've got brothers and sisters from around the world uh, that gather here daily, 228 days in a row, for the Word of God. Um, we're here, we're preaching truth, we're talking about Jesus, we're encouraging one another. Uh, this is something that not only can you catch live, but you can also catch on the replay or even on the podcast. I know a lot of people don't show up. They go, oh, well, it, it doesn't work for my schedule. Awesome. We've got, uh, you know, we, we can help you with that. If you can't make it live, you can catch this later. Uh, you, you, I mean, there's every single one has been saved to my profile. You can start at the beginning. You can catch up. You can breeze through them. But uh, there's really no excuse on why you can't be a part of it. If you miss it, you can always make it up. You guys, we've got brothers and sisters from around the world. Hawthorne, California, Chicago, New Mexico, South Carolina. Uh, really... This is worldwide and uh, humbled, honored, and truly grateful to be a part of, uh, you know, what God is doing here in this place. Puerto Rico, Texas, um, it's, just, uh, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing thing that we've got going on. Um, I want to encourage you guys, listen. You guys, pay attention. If you are here, don't just check out. Don't just let this run in the back. I want you guys to pay special, special attention this morning. We cut out yesterday a little early because um, unbeknownst to you, I had a uh, interview that I had to do online um, for a television show that hasn't aired yet. Once it's aired and edited, I will get that posted and share the link with you guys. But um, we had to cut out on Genesis. And then the day before that, when we were doing an altar call, we had to cut out early and uh, we left this. So I want to start today with a word, uh, then prayer. We're going to start with Genesis. I just want to do a quick recap and then we're going to jump into 1 Peter. Our devotions are found at the bottom. Uh, again, you guys are reading this on your own. All right. You guys are reading this on your own. I'm giving you guys context. I'm giving you food for thought uh, and sharing with you guys what the, the Holy Spirit is putting on, uh, you know, on, on my heart um, with you guys. So the first thing is this. How many of you guys have been under attack recently? Right. Everybody's hands should be up because in some way, shape or form, we've all been experiencing spiritual attack. This is what God put on my heart this morning as I was praying. I recognize and understand that the enemy has been turning up the temperature on uh, Christians and individuals who are making a solid effort to know Christ more, to stand for truth, and to make a difference in this world, right? there, It's coming in the form of sickness. It's coming in the form of injury. It's coming in the form of loss. It's coming in the form of mental battles. It's coming in the form of mental health issues. It's coming in the form of, uh, of even like confrontation and conflict. Notice that some of your relationships are starting to get a squeeze on them. They're starting to become and create uh, the, this contention in some of your relationships. There's, there's, you're starting to see things in a different light. Things that once didn't bother you are now starting to bother you. You guys, please understand that there is a spiritual war that is taking place. Now, when you hear that you're being un that, you're, that you're under attack, how many of that? How how many of you guys get discouraged? Right? How many of you guys get uh, upset? Oh, I'm under attack. Oh, I'm, I'm, there's a spiritual war going on. I'm under attack. The attack is heavy. And so, when you hear that, when you say that, you start to uh, you start to get down. Maybe you've done something wrong. Right? I'm here to tell you guys stop. Can we please change our perspective and the mindset of what it means to be under attack? Why, let's take this out of the spiritual realm. Why would something, why would somebody attack something? Most of the time, it's because it's a threat. When we go to war, many times uh, the, 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 the country that is attacking the other country is doing so because they are a threat. Listen, brother or sister, understand this Christian you are under attack because you are a threat. Let, let that sink in for just a moment. You are under attack because you are a threat. It, it is personal. They, the, the enemy, right? Again, the enemy sees you as a problem. And so what the enemy is doing is attacking you, increasing the amount of attention, increasing the amount of troops that are surrounding you because what you are doing is a threat to the kingdom of hell. 
But we have to remind ourselves, listen, you are under attack because you were a threat, but we, right, we are in the army of God. Understand that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Understand that the power in you is greater than the power in this world. Understand that as you're under attack, you have the victory. The devil knows how this ends. The enemy knows how this ends. So rather than us tucking our tail, getting discouraged and feeling downcast, understand who you are. In a sense, when we start to look at attack in a negative uh, uh, outlet, we start that that's the beginning of us surrendering and giving up, throwing in the towel. When we start to see it as an issue, remind the devil of how this turns out. Remind the devil of whose army you're in. Remind the devil of the power that you have and start to realize that, oh, I'm under attack because I'm heading in the right direction. My brother, Jeremy, he might not be on here right now. Your daily dose of scripture is his handle. Uh, we, in our men's group a few weeks ago, he said this, man, if you guys are familiar with video games, right? If you guys know anything about video games, as you're roaming through video games, you head in the direction of the most opposition, right? You head in the direction of the most opposition. So if I'm playing a game and I'm walking my character through, let's say it's a zombie game, the more zombies I see, Right? I know that I'm heading towards the goal. I'm heading in the right direction. If maybe I get turned around and I'm heading back to the starting point, I start to realize that there's no enemies. There's no opposition. What's going on? I'm heading in the wrong direction. Oh, I must have got turned around. Let me look at the map. Oh, I'm heading in the wrong direction. And so I start going in the right direction. And then I start going in the right direction. Understand that now there's more resistance. The enemies are popping up around every corner until I get to the goal. And understand that as I get closer to the goal, the opposition increases. Now there's more enemies, right? There's that, there's that big boss at the end of each level. Again, if you don't know video games, that, that's what it is. Think of Mario. As you're going through Mario, the, the obstacles and the difficulty of the level increases. The time limit starts to get faster and the music starts to speed up and it starts to get more challenging. And once you jump up and grab the pole, you enter into the castle and now you got to fight King Koopa. The big boss is at the end. And so what's happening here is as we are getting closer to where God is calling us, the opposition is getting heavier. It's getting faster. It's getting more frequent. It's getting more challenging. We're heading in the right direction. But many of us, we see that and we collapse and we faint and we throw in the towel. And well, woe is me. I'm discouraged because I'm under attack. No, my friend, that means you're right where God wants you to be. When you're weak, he's strong. Tap into his strength. Grab a hold of truth and know that you're on the path that God has called you to be. I, I, all I see is Christians bowed down, beat up, discouraged because they're under attack. Listen, homie, you're a threat to the kingdom. Of course, you're going to be under attack it's because you're doing something. You're breaking chains. You're stepping up in your prayer life. You're devoting time to scripture. You're starting to be who God called you to be. And the enemy is here trying to discourage you from moving forward to where God wants you to be. Do you guys get that? Can we wake up? Like I, I, I'm, I'm every all of my just people just bowed down, beat down, discouraged, crying about everything. And I'm not trying to be uh, non empathetic, right? I'm not trying to be hard hearted. And you can be like, well, what, Andrew? That's not very Jesus like. Look, I love you, and so I'm trying to call you guys higher. Please understand, I, God has called me to something and we're heading in that direction. If you can't keep up, uh, I, I love you. I'm gonna pray for you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some distance between where you're at and where I'm going because God is calling me in a direction and I am under attack every single day. The attack is real. Guys, the attack is real, but please don't mistake. Don't just, I'm trying to lead by example. I'm showing up here every single day on fire with passion because you know what? I'm under attack uh, uh, constantly. God has called us to something and there's attacks of the enemy and there's this disruption and there's things pulling at focus and, and all that God put on my heart this morning. He was like, I was like, God, what's going on? He's like, I got you right where I want you. You're right where you need to be. Where's your faith? Be alert. Stay awake. Right now is the time that you need to cling to me. Grab a hold of my garment and hold on. Right now where you feel like you're weak, I'm your strength. I'm your endurance. I'm your comfort. I want you to feel like this because right now you need me. You're, you're in a place of like, look, man, you're in a place of I am reliant on God. I can't get through this attack without him. Therefore, it's not by my strength. It's not by my might. It's not because of the amount of time that I devote to it. It's because of Jesus. 
He is carrying me through the attacks. He is getting me. He is my strong tower. He is my shelter. He is my fortress. Understand, these are all terms of protection. In a war, when you're under attack, what do you do? You hide behind the protection of the fortress, right? You run to the strong tower. You, you, you take this shield and you stand behind it. Jesus is my shield. He's my strong tower. He's my refuge. I hide in the shadow of his wing. As the arrows are coming up, I'm underneath his wing and he's taking the brunt of all of it. Listen, God won. Please don't forget that. Remind yourself of who the enemy is. Remind yourself of where he's going. We need to start walking in the victory. I'm under attack. And you say it as if it's a bad thing or that you're surprised. Hey, guess what, bud? You're supposed to be under attack. Uh, what, 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 is, what, what, what is going to make you happy? What is going to satisfy you? A life of peace and ease and comfort where there's no distraction. There's, there, nothing's pulling at your attention. Everything is going as, as you want it to go. As you want it to go. That, I can't, that's never going to happen. Wake up. That's not, that's eternity. We're talking, that's not going to happen until you breathe your last breath and you take your last step into eternity. That's where you're going to receive the peace that you're looking for, the comfort, the ease. There is no death. There is no tragedy. There is no grief. You're, what you're longing for is perfection. And that isn't until you breathe your last breath. But until then, you're on assignment here on this earth. You guys get it? Are we going to continue to walk with our head down, beat down, bowed down, allowing the enemy to have the victory? It's a choice. It's an absolute choice. If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a great reminder. But what do you guys do with this reminder? Oh, that's a word. That's fire. Fire extinguisher emoji. Oh, I love that. And then we unplug from coffee and prayer right back to our, our pile of disappointment. We go right back to discouragement. We run right back to sadness and, and, and uh, the pity party that we've set up for ourselves. Let's pray. And then we're going to jump into scripture. That was just what God put on my heart this morning as I woke up. As I, I, continue, I'm, I continue to see and witness and experience brothers and sisters in Christ who are perpetually defeated. They have no victory. They're not holding tight to the promises. The battle's in their mind and they're walking around discouraged, hijacking others. Uh, just, come on. Let me read some of these comments real quick. Yeah. You guys don't, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with what I have to say either. This is what God put on my heart. And maybe this is, um, maybe what, maybe what I'm even saying is further along than where you're at. You know, not everybody's ready to receive a word like that. This might offend some of you. And if it offends you, um, talk to God. All right. I don't know about you, but I've been called the victory. I know who I am. And I love that in, uh, first, first Peter, uh, Today, we're going to talk, we're going to share my favorite verse, actually the verse that my entire church, Royal City Church, was built on. Uh, but let's pray. I don't want to digress. Uh, I want to I want to get through this. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We are so grateful and honored for the time that we get to spend together, Lord. We just pray that you would help us to receive. God, that you would set aside our ego, uh, that you would set aside just anything that we're dealing with and anything that's pulling at our focus or our attention, God, help us to set our eyes on you. Uh, you are the perfecter of our faith. You are our everything, our strength, our comfort, our endurance. We cannot do this without you, Lord. We need you. And, and knowing that, God, you're with us. You're here. You haven't left us. You haven't forsaken us. You haven't forgotten about us. Uh, you are with us every step of the way. You are fully aware of the attack that we're under. God, we can't even begin to fathom of what that attack would be like if you weren't here with us. And God, we know that the the intensity and the frequency of the attacks are, are increasing because we are on the path that you have called us to be. We are heading in the direction where we are back on assignment. We are back on mission. We are checking off objectives day after day. We are growing in our faith, our knowledge, wisdom, and understanding understanding of who you are and who you say that we are. And so Lord, we expect and we are ready for the attacks of the enemy. 
And we stand on the promise that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Lord, they will form, they will try, they will come. But because we have you, they will not prosper. And that's truth. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Um, Genesis, we're going we're gonna to rewind for just a second. I want to get us caught up on this latest episode of Maury Povich. Uh, this, this whole, like, the book is entertaining. When people tell me that the Bible's boring, I'm just like, bro, start in Genesis. It's so entertaining. I love it. Um, just kind of a recap. That's all we're going to do. And then I want to fire up. Um, we're, we're completely backwards, but I've neglected uh, to, to get us to where we need to be. We've we, we got cut off on 29, 30 was cut short. We're all the way in 31. Um, we'll do it quick. And then we're going to jump right into first Peter. And then tomorrow we're back to normal schedule. So listen, uh, in 30, you know, we, we understand that Jacob, uh, he's got basically four wives. He's in love with Rachel. He got Leah because she was the older sister and Laban, their dad kind of pulled the, he okie doked him, right? He said, Hey, yeah, you can have my daughter, Rachel's hand. You got, you know, and he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll work for you for seven years. Boom. He works for seven years on the night of the wedding. They slide Leah into the tent. He lays with her and wakes up and like, what just happened? And he's like, oh, well, it's our custom. You got to be with the older sister. Uh, we, we can't marry off the younger one before the older. And he's like, oh, my goodness. He's like, well, look, give me another seven years and I'll let you marry Rachel next week. So not only did he get Leah and her maid, her, her handmaid, whatever you want to call her. He also got Rachel a week later uh, and her handmaid and then had to work for another seven years. So what you see is now um, Leah, although that's not his favorite wife, he's in love with Rachel, but she ends up giving him like six kids. And then her, her, her handmaid gives her a bunch of kids too. Uh, well, Rachel's a little bit jealous and kind of like, oh, you know, you were supposed to love me, but God's closing up my womb. I want you to lay with my maid. And so her maid starts giving him a bunch of kids. And then after a while, Rachel's womb opens up and gives. And so it's like, homie's got four wives and a bunch of kids. He's got Mo ladies, mo problems. He's got mo kids, mo problems. But the beautiful thing is that God is continuing to bless him, right? He's blessing him. He's he's uh, you know he's he's giving him a bunch uh, of things. And so Jacob goes in and makes an agreement with Laban, and he's like, "Look, Laban, I want to go." He's like, I, "I've got all these kids. I got all these headaches. I got all this stuff going on. The girls are, you know, they're battling each other. Like, who can have more babies? Like, it's crazy. I got a lot of mouths to feed. Let me leave." He's like, no, please stay. Uh, you know, you can have anything that you want. Let's make an agreement. You know, take these flock and, and whichever ones you want, you can have. And so uh, we, we find out that, um, you know, God starts blessing that. God starts blessing the, the sheep and he starts to expand Jacob's, uh, all of his, everything that his hand touches, man. All, he, he's his, his goat, his sheep, his land, his maids. He's just like being prospered. God is prospering him. Uh and so what happens is Laban, the, the, the father-in-law, he starts looking at Jacob with a little bit of contempt. Like, you know, I feel like he's cheating me. Like I, I'm seeing that all of his stuff is doubling. My kingdom, my, my stuff is getting smaller. His sons start hyping him up. And he's just like, you know what? Uh, it says that he started to look at, um, look at, he, he said that he started to look at him without favor. His countenance changed. The way that he was looking at Jacob was like, it wasn't favorable. And so God came to Jacob and was like, you got to return back home. All right. And remember that Jacob left home because he cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. And Esau was mad. He was about to kill him. So Jacob, he's got problems back home with his brother because he was being shysty. He moves out here. Now he's got four baby mamas, a dozen kids, right? He's got, he's, he's got like a, a bunch of stuff going on over here. Now his father-in-law is mad at him because he's doing well. Now God's saying, go back home where you, you know, where you had issues with your brother. It's all wild, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, uh, rather than going to Laban and saying, Hey, we're out of here. He sneaks off. He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm out of here. Hey, get the kids, get the stuff. We're going to dip. So, uh, while, while Laban's off tending to his herd, he sneaks out. Well, unfortunately, Rachel, right? Uh, Jacob's favorite wife sneaks into dad's house and steals his favorite idol. Like, you know, I'm going to take something with me. So she goes in and she grabs the little golden calf or whatever it is, whatever little idol that he had takes that with and they take off. Boom. Three days later, Laban finds out and is like, okay, not cool. He dipped out. Where's my, my grandkids? Where's my daughters? Uh, on top of that, they stole my little God. 
I'm out. So he chases him down and he catches him. When he catches him, he starts questioning Jacob. Why'd you flee? Why'd you run? Why'd you take everything? You wouldn't give, you know, I'm their dad. You know, he's like, this is all mine. This is all my stuff. And I see how you've been treating. You've been ungrateful. And Jacob's like, man, I wasn't ungrateful. I've given you 20 plus years of service. You tricked me out of your daughters. You made me marry Leah when that's not even the one I wanted. Now I got four wives, a bunch of kids. All I wanted was your daughter, Rachel. So they're like button heads, right? Uh, Laban thinks he's right in being cheated. Jacob thinks he's right in being cheated. They come to agreement. They make a covenant. Hey, we're going to set up this pillar of rocks. You don't cross this one. You don't cross this one. We're not going to do each other any harm. And they come to agreement. They sacrifice uh, basically like a blood bond. And then they move forward. You guys, we are caught up to Genesis 31. That is the that is the shortened version. That's what I got out of it as I was reading it. But I'm reading it like intense. It's like, man, this is good. This is like the day. I don't need a soap opera. Or I don't need reality TV. I got Genesis. Jacob's life sounds challenging. I think that I got it bad, man. No, he had four wives. I love the one that I've got. I couldn't imagine having four and they're like, there's conflict in between them. Rachel and Leah are going like this. I bet the maids are looking at each other some kind of way. They, I mean, Jacob's exhausted, right? Imagine not only practicing bearing children with the four of them, but then he's raising a bunch of kids. His father-in-law don't like him. He's got problems back home with his brother. Woo. It was a lot, man. It was a lot. So, uh, glory to God. We're, we're, we're heading back to some reconciliation. We, we see Laban and Jacob, they come to a common ground, a common agreement. Uh, they agree to disagree, essentially. And now we're going to jump into tomorrow and the next couple of days of uh, him returning home and the, the, the way that things go there. Amen. <laughs> he said, Philip said four is too much. That's four of them shopping at Target. That's expensive, bro. One of them shopping at Target. Me going to Target is expensive. Uh, I'm sorry, man. It, I go in there for a pack of bacon and came out, you know, my brother Carlos just went in there. He said he missed men's group because he came out with a Keurig. I was like, bro, what did you go in there for? He went in there for like a tire pump and came out with a Keurig. What? That's crazy. Target does me like that every single time. I, I, there's things I didn't even know I needed. But, uh, you know, anyway, let's uh, let's jump into First Peter. This is how we're going to finish. We went backwards today. So listen, buckle up, put your seatbelt on. This is the fire. If you've made it this far, this is what we need. So in chapter one, okay, in chapter one, it said, uh, you know, it kind of ended. You were born. This is this. Is, I'm, I'm recapping just to get us to where we need to be. It says you were born again through God's living message, right? And this is the word that was preached to you. Uh, he's saying, hey, make make your souls pure by obeying the truth. Love each other deeply with all your heart. You've been born again, and this new life did not come from something that dies, but something that cannot die. So verse or chapter two starts with this. It starts with this. So then, rid yourselves of all evil, all lying, hypocrisy, jealousy, and evil speech. Rid yourselves, right? Because you're a new creation, because you've been born again, rid yourselves of all evil, all lying, hypocrisy, jealousy, and evil speech. Uh, immediately, Immediately, the first thing that pops to mind is, uh, is is secular music, music that doesn't glorify and honor God, right? And, and again, this this is me attacking um, a lot of you because you still are holding on to some of the things that are so near and dear to your heart that come from the world. Uh, it's not just that, but this is like immediate. My spirit is just like some of you guys are holding on to things that are keeping you in bondage. Some of you guys are holding on to things that, that it's plain to you, but it irritates you because you've got to let something go that you really love. And in this moment, you're literally choosing the world over the word. You're choosing to ignore the Holy Spirit. You're choosing to ignore this warning. And if God can't trust you with this warning, why would he give you more? Why would he, why would he reveal more to you? Like, here's this revelation. The things that you're consuming are not helping you get closer to him. Here's it it's saying this right here. Rid yourselves of all evil. If the music you're talking, uh, you're, you're listening to is talking about evil things, it's talking about lust, it's talking about jealousy, it's talking about envy, it's talking about lies, it's talking about uh, idolatry, it's talking about the pursuit and love of money, it's talking about materials. If the music that you're consuming is talking about evil, it's saying to rid yourself of that, right? 
a lot of the music you're you're listening to, even oh well, I just like R and B. R and B is talking about cheating on your spouse. It's talking about uh, falling in love with people uh, and really idolizing relationships. A lot of R and B is talking about sex outside of wedlock. It's talking about you know, it's talking about things. Oh well, it's all about love. No, love was demonstrated by Jesus going to the cross while we were still sinners. That's the only kind of love that I want to be involved with. You guys understand that? So many of us, we will compromise, we will shift, we will manipulate the scripture, we will compromise our beliefs and values and ignore the scripture in order to listen to things that we want to listen to. And many times that very thing that you're holding on to is the thing that God's trying to break in you before he takes you to the next level. And so you sit there and wonder, why is God not working in my life? Why am I not seeing a breakthrough? And he's saying, I'm screaming at you to let go of some of these things and you're refusing to let go. And here's the thing is you can't go to the next level of where I'm calling you while you're holding on to these things. These things of the world can't come with you. And so you're refusing to let go and then wondering why you won't move forward. And he's saying, I'm not going to budge. One of us are going to have to break and it's going to be you. So at some point, you're going to have to let those things go. Rid yourselves of all evil, lying, hypocrisy, jealousy, and evil speech. Evil speech. Hypocrisy. It's hypocritical of me to sit here and with the same mouth, give praise, worship, and honor to God, and then hop on the newest song and drop the F-bomb and the S-bomb and the H-bomb and the L-bomb and the L-M-N-O-P-Q-R-S-T-U-V-bomb. And I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm shouting this. Look, if you are able to quote these songs better than you're able to quote scripture, I think that there's an issue. I'm going to just let, sit, that, sit on that for a second. If you are more able to sing these songs, these trending TikTok songs, and when you hear the beat drop, you're able to uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, U, and your friends, and me, 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 me. If you know, right, and you guys, some of you right away knew what song I was talking about. If you're able to hear that beat drop and you're able to go into it, but you can't even quote scripture, that's an issue. That tells me right then and there, right? This is conviction for some of you that some of you guys are holding on and you're closer to the world you are than you are to the word. That's a problem. That's an issue. So, so guess what? So when the issues spring up and you're dealing with the things that the, the world is attacking you with, you're more likely to quote the wisdom of the world than the word. And what do we need? We need the word, not the wisdom of the world. We just talked about it. Christian just brought up a good point. We just talked about the power of the tongue a chapter or two ago, right? Maybe it was James. We talked about the power of the tongue. Nobody can tame it. The things that we consume, right? The things that are written on our heart, they come out of our mouth. That we, we speak those things. So from in our innermost being and what's going on in here come out of our mouth. So if the things that I'm consuming and writing on my heart when I'm put into a situation that might be challenging, what's going to come out is the things that I've been putting in. Right now, whether you guys knew the song or not, that's not the point. Because if I said one, two, three into the four, Snoop Doggy Dog and who? Dr. Dre is at your door. Right, you guys, there, there's there's songs, and maybe it's not rap. I could probably go through, and there's songs that as soon as you heard the beat, you could probably quote it word for word. You know the the you know it all, man, from start to finish. But if I was like, okay, what does First Peter chapter two verse three say? You'd be like, uh. Uh, I don't know which one's going to bring life, which one's going to edify, which one's going to protect. We talked about being in a war, which one's going to protect you, but you will devote time, energy, and effort to being able to quote a song because it was cool, popular, and trendy. Yet all that does is lead you down a road of death. It leads you down a road of destruction. It says to rid yourselves of all evil, all lying, hypocrisy, jealousy, and evil speech. It says that you are a new creation. You have been born again. And this new life did not come from something that dies, but something from that, from something that cannot die. Now you can sit there and say, oh, Andrew, you're being a Pharisee. Oh, Andrew, you're being religious. You know, there's freedom in Christ. We can do all that we want. You're absolutely right. Have all of the freedom you like. But what I'm telling you is that the things that you consume will directly affect the way that you live. And that's scripture, that's truth. What you take in will surely be written on your heart and will come out. Maybe you're not ready for this. Let's move on to verse two. It says, as newborn babies want milk, you should want the pure and simple teaching. By it, you can grow up and be saved because you've already examined and seen how good the Lord is. This is, this is, this is the next part. Verse five, we're gonna jump ahead. It says, you also are like living stones. Let me rewind. It says, the people of the world did not want this stone. 
right? The G Jesus, I'm just gonna have to start with four. It all makes sense, right? Come to the Lord Jesus, the stone that lives. The people of the world did not want this stone, but he was the stone that God chose and he was precious, right? They might not have wanted Jesus, but they got Jesus. He is who God chose. It's what you get. And verse five says, you also are like living stones. So let yourselves be used to build a spiritual temple, to be holy, to be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. You too are also a stone and you're a part of the body of Christ. You're being made, you're being used to be built up a temple, right? If, if we're building something and it's built on Christ, but you aren't, uh, you aren't sturdy, God's going to flick you out of that spot and put somebody else in there, right? It's going to put somebody else in there. You are like a living stone, so let yourselves be used. God wants to use you to build a spiritual temple, to be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Um, there are things, that this, is not, this is out of context, so this, take this with a grain of salt. I believe that there are things that we have to sacrifice and lay down on the altar to be who God called us to be. I, I don't see how we can profess and say that we love God and be used and to be these holy temples, yet we still hold on to tradition, religion, and things of this world and sit here and say, well, God, I want you to use me. Here's the beauty. He will use us. He can use the least of us. He can use us in our unrefined form. He can use us raw and, and, and wherever it is that we're at. I won't limit God, but, but many of us aren't being used to our fullest potential because we're not ready. Many of us aren't being used to, uh, God's like, I, I, I can do more with you if you would prepare yourself. I could do more with you if you would ready your heart. I could do, I want to take you further and farther. I have a great big plan, purpose and will for your life. I want to do more with you, but you aren't prepared. You're not ready to go where I want you to go. In fact, you're behind right? Where you should be now. You've been flirting and having a, a relationship with the world for so long. I'm trying to pull some things out of you and get you to this place where I can propel you. I want to accelerate you. I want to take you to places and do things with you that you can't even imagine, but you're not ready because you're not willing to break up the love affair that you're having with the world. Moving forward, it talks about uh, Christ being the cornerstone that will make people stumble. Right. It says they stumble because they do not obey what God says, which is what God planned to happen to them. Uh, many of us stumble because there's no obedience. We're not obeying God. You guys understand that there's this word obedience, obey. We're not saved by our works. We've established that we're saved by faith. But what you do after you're saved is important. There, there's still choices and decisions that need to be made. You still have to answer and account for the time that you spent here on this earth after you were saved. We're not accounting for our sins. Our sins were paid for. But how did you spend your life after Christ, after salvation? Did you take this knowledge and wisdom of salvation, this truth, this beautiful gift that you were given? And did you squander it? Did you take it in high? it and sit on it and just go up oh, yeah i'm saved I, I know jesus and then didn't really do anything with it or did you get out and spread the word did you share the love you have this truth you have the gospel right did you allow that to burn inside of you did you get to know the word did you get to know the lover of your soul did you sit in his presence did you fall on your knees did you worship him how did you use the that, that once you received salvation how did you use that time how right so many of us are, are okay with being complacent and sitting on the sidelines watching other people do the work. And God's saying, no, I, I saved you for a purpose. I didn't save you to sit on the sidelines. I want to use you too. I, I want you to be a part of this. But it says this, they stumble, right? You're stumbling, you're struggling, you're not, because you don't obey, because they do not obey what God says. So here, it, it's as simple as this. If you're feeling the conviction right now, oh, I need to clean up the stuff that I'm listening to and consuming. Man, I feel that. That sounds like he's talking to me. All this message is for me. Oh man, I got to make a change, okay? That's conviction from the Holy Spirit. We get off the live and what do you do? Boom, you turn up the music and you bump it even harder. So, so that's you. You have the conviction. Holy Spirit was speaking to you. Gosh, man, there's this change that needs to be elicited. You need to repent. You, that, that's that like, oh man, God, you were talking to me. That was for me. I repent. I receive that word. Here, let me make a change. And now the change comes with action. So you receive the conviction. You allow God to speak to you. And then that 
creates change. And from that moment, you go in a different direction. You go through and you prune and audit and clean up your music. And you know, you, you start to make an actual change. That's obedience. So now you're obeying the Holy Spirit that's being like that's inside of you, that's convicting you. And, and from there, now you're no longer stumbling in that area. He goes, awesome. They learned, they grew from that. I'm able to speak to them. Now we have this open lane of communication. They're reading the word, the word's convicting them. Now they're being changed and heading in a different direction, right? And so now that you've allowed that, that change to occur, God's like, awesome. Now we, we, we fixed that, like we cleaned that part up. Let's go this way. And so that's, that's sanctification. That's the process of becoming who God called you to be is, is he'll address something. You have the choice. Do I obey it? Do I listen to it? Do I allow it to change me or do I ignore it? If I continue to ignore it, I'm going to stay right where I'm at. And that same lesson is going to continue to repeat and repeat and repeat the cycle of sin, repentance, conviction, sin. Ah, all right. Uh, I'm going to repent conviction. Oh, I need to do. Uh, and then you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over. And you are going to continue to stumble and stumble and stumble until you start to obey what it is that God's trying to change in you. Once you receive that conviction, you, re you, you start to act with repentance and you start to obey what it is that he's calling you to do. Then and only then is he able to move you forward to the next lesson. And then it's going to be the same thing. Am I aware? Am I awake? Am I listening? Am I being moldable? Am I, am I allowing the potter to actually mold me and shape me and refine me? Or am I being disobedient? Am I ignoring that? Am I choosing? Okay, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to switch and twist and manipulate the word because I'm not ready for that, God. I just want to stay right where I'm at. That's what happens to a lot of people. This is my verse, man. Verse nine, right? Verse nine. Um, remind yourself of this. You are a chosen people, royal priesthoods, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You were chosen to tell all about the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So many people, what, what, what does God want to do with my life? Who am I? This is what Royal City, we call this, this is Royal City because of this verse, because you are a chosen people. God chose you. You have been chosen. You, you have the divine revelation of who Jesus is. It's not an accident that you know that Jesus is the Messiah. He, God opened your eyes. He allowed you to receive this, right? It says you're royal priesthood. You are your royalty. So you've been chosen. You are royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession. He is our possessor. He is our creator. We are his and we are his to do with whatever it is that he pleases. And he's trying to develop in us this sense of dependence, this sense of love, this sense of honor and reverence and respect that we have for the one who created us. We're his and he could do with us as he pleases, right? You were chosen, right? It said you were chosen. Why were, oh, why were we chosen? We were chosen to tell about the wonderful acts of God. Hey, I chose you. I saved you for a purpose. You once were lost. Now you're found. Now you have a job. I want you to do this. I saved you for a reason. I saved you for this. It's a beautiful thing. Well, what, what was it? Uh, I, cho I chose you to tell about the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I once was in the darkness. Now I'm in the light. God pulled me out of the darkness, put me in the light. Now let me go tell everybody about it. Man, you should have seen how I used to live. I was bad. I was bad to the bone. I was a minister to society. You wouldn't have liked the old me. What changed? Jesus. Let me tell you about him. I have the absolute privilege to share with the world. That's why we chose the name Royal City Church, because we are a royal priesthood. We have been chosen. We are a holy nation. And it is our privilege to sit here and tell the world about the one who pulled me out of darkness and put me into the light. I owe every breath that I breathe to him. Because he's good and faithful. He could have left me right where I was at. And I'm telling you now, if he left me right where I was at, I'd probably be dead today. But he had mercy and he had a plan. And because that he pulled, because he pulled me out of darkness, because I once was lost, but now I'm found, because of what he did, I want to live a life that brings honor and glory to him. Verse 10, at one time you were not a people, right? But now you are God's people. In the past, you had never received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy moving forward. Dear friends, you are like foreigners and strangers in this world, all right? I talked about this the other day. We're aliens, man. We're in this world. We're in this place. This is not our home. It's not our final destination. This is not, uh, this is not all she wrote. Look, man, I got to put the windows down. I'm sweating. It's getting humid, right? We're stepping into June and uh, whew, 
June in California is warm. So I'm like, I'm dying in here. So listen, you're like foreigners and strangers in this world. This is not your home. This world is not where your hope should be, your trust should be, your faith should be. If you are dead set on worldly success, worldly wisdom, you know, if, if that's all that you're focused on, you're missing the point. You guys understand that? You're a foreigner. The next thing says, I beg you to avoid the evil things your body wants to do that fight against your soul. I had a talk with my boy Jalen yesterday. Uh, again, people... I hear a lot of Christians say, hey, I, I, I stumbled into sin. I fell into sin. Um, you know, I tripped up. All of that says is that you made a mistake or, or, or no, 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 that it was an accident. You guys, sin is not an accident. It, you, you choose sin. You don't, the, you know, so many people give the devil far more credit than he deserves. Oh, the devil made me do it. No, we didn't. You did it. It was your evil desires that war within you. You fed your, you fed your flesh. You refused to feed the spirit and you chose, you made a decision. Okay. When we start talking about, I, 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 I fell, I tripped, I stumbled, right? It takes away the accountability of you making poor decisions. And now you're able to blame the devil. The devil made me do it. That's not true. The devil didn't make you do anything. The war that's inside of you, the flesh versus your spirit, you decided to choose flesh. It was your choice. It was your decision. You ignored the Holy Spirit. You ignored every red flag. You ignored the way that God gave you. He gave you a way out. In 1 Corinthians, it says that there's no temptation that God will not provide a way out. You ignored the way out. You decided not to do what God called you to do. And at the end of the day, you chose sin. You chose it. So, so what it's literally saying, Hey, I beg you to avoid the evil things that your body wants to do your body, your flesh, flesh versus spirit. Your body wants to do these evil things, avoid them, right? When it says avoid, man, I'm thinking of like, yo, I'm trying to avoid you like the plague. I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep social distance between me and sin. I'm, I need that six feet. I'm double masked up with a visor. Whether you agree with the mask mandate, I'm not even saying that I do. I'm using it as an analogy because it's something relevant that we've all dealt with. So please keep your comments about the masks to yourself. I'm not promoting them or endorsing them. I'm using them for a, a, a picture here. So listen, here's sin. Here's me. I'm going to need that six feet. I want to avoid it. I'm going to be double masked up with a visor and a full body suit. Avoid it like the plague. Avoid it, run from it, stay away from it, keep your distance because understand there's a part of me, there's a remnant of my flesh that dwells within. It says that there's a, it's fighting against your spirit. The closer I get to sin, right? It says you can't take fire into your lap and not be burnt, but many Christians are trying to get as close to sin as we can without calling it sin, getting as close to it. Well, is this a sin is, well, if I do this, is that a sin, right? Well, why do you want to know? Are you trying to get as close to it as possible, right? As close, well, I want to get as close as I can. I want to get, I want to stay as close to the world as possible without crossing the line. When you start asking the question, is this a sin? Is that a sin? That tells me that your heart posture is already wrong. Your heart posture is already wrong because what you want to do is you're, you're trying to get as close to it as possible without getting burnt. I don't know about you, uh, but I've seen there's this video going viral right now about an, it's an orangutan who grabs this dude who got too close to the cage and one in somebody's caption, they were quick with it. They said me trying to get too close to sin. This man was really close to the orangutan cage and he got as close as he could, but he didn't realize that the orangutan has got a seven foot arm reach. And so what he does is boop, grabs a hold of this dude and yanks him to the cage. And now he's got both hands and one of his feet, which is built like a hand. And he's got this dude wrapped up. If you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's how a lot of Christians do. We're trying to tiptoe as close to the cage as absolutely possible. And then guess what? Boom, boom, boom. Bah, they got you. And it's too late. He says, avoid. I beg you to avoid the evil things your body wants to do that fight against your soul. Next verse. Live such good lives that they will see the good things you do and will give glory to God in the day when Christ comes. There's such an emphasis on how we live our lives, how we live our lives. And you'll hear me say this over and over and over and over and over again. Many times you're the only Bible that some people will ever read. 
Some people are, some people will never walk in or step foot into the door of a church, but they might come into contact with you. If I'm saying, Oh, I'm a, I'm a believer, man. I follow Jesus. Jesus changed my life. But then they look at us and we are living the same way that the world lives. We're listening to the same thing. We're watching the same thing. There's no difference in how we live. Where is the power of Christ? Where is the power of transformation? Where is the testimony of what God has done in your life? So many of us are, we're quick to say that we're followers of Jesus, but we're not following Jesus. So many of us are quick to say, yeah, man, I would die for Jesus, but you're not even living for Jesus. Let me say that again. So many people are quick to say, I would die for Jesus. If, if, if the Bible became illegal, man, and somebody had a gun to my head and they told me to renounce Jesus, I would die for him. But it's like, homie, you're not even living for him. What makes you think that you're going to have the boldness on that day to stand for him? You, you won't even live for him telling me that you're going to die for him. I call BS. I call your bluff. You won't even give up the worldly music. You won't even give up the things of this world for him. But you're going to tell me you're going to lay your life down? I see through it. I see through it. We are so good at talking and speaking Christianese. We're so good at, uh, you know, playing the part of what it looks like to be a Christian, but behind closed doors, we're not even close. We're not even following Jesus. We're not even living for him. The way that you live is everything. He says, look, he said, you're a foreigner in this world. You're a stranger. Stop trying to fit in. Stop looking for validation. Stop looking for your worth and your identity here in this world. It's not going to be found. You are a stranger in this land. Stop trying to be like this world. Live such good lives that people will see the good things that you do. Live a life that is pure and blameless and holy and pursues righteousness. A, a life that is absent of compromise. A life that is on fire for him. And that's going to speak volumes Trust the word. Don't yoke yourself with non-believers. Don't compromise. Don't go, don't be dating and having sex before marriage. Stop going out and getting drunk. Stop doing the things that this world is glorifying. When you start to live a life that's on fire for him, people can see it from a mile away. It's like a light on a hill. Understand this world is dark and it's evil. So when you start to make a stand for him, he illuminates this light and it is seen by many for miles away. And just like moths are attracted to the light, so will unbelievers, non-believers, people who don't know Jesus. They'll be drawn to you because it's not, I mean, if you just look like the world, they're going to be like, yo, he just looks like one of us. But no, he, he's not moved by every chaotic and, and confusing thing that happens. He's not moved uh, by, by every natural disaster. He's not moved by every famine and pandemic. He's not moved by everything. There's a light. There's something different. What is he holding on to? It's like he's built on a rock. He's unshakable. He's unmovable. Man, what is it that he has? It's not money. It's not riches. It's not wealth. What is it that he has that I don't have? That keeps him unshakable and unmovable. Why is he filled with so much hope and peace and joy in the middle of all this chaos? And when they come close to here, what is it that you have? You get to say, I have Jesus. I have Jesus. Jesus is the difference. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is my anchor. My hope is in eternity, not in this world. Because how I live makes a difference. Because how I live shines bright for him. You can see it in my eyes. You can see it in my words. You can see it in my actions. You can see it in the passion. When you get passionate, there's a saying that says, man, if, if, you, would, if you would get on fire for Jesus, the whole world will come around and watch you burn. And that's a positive thing, man. If you would get on fire for Jesus, unshakable, unmovable, right? If when you stop compromising and you live a life of obedience, you become so on fire that people from around the world are going to come and watch and go, what is it that this got this man on fire? Because I want some of that. I want my faith to be so loud and so encouraging and inspiring that people are like, I want what he's got. What is it that you have? All I've got is Jesus, baby. It's nothing else than that. Nothing that I have is because of my talent. It's not because of my resources. It's not because of my looks. It's not because of my height, my stature, my past, my upbringing, my education. It's all because of Jesus. Do you guys see that? That's what it's all about. 
I, I promise you that I am just a guy in a Jeep who loves Jesus, but people are drawn to what we're doing here because of the passion and because of the fire, because of the excitement and because how I'm living on screen is how I live behind the scenes. It, it's real. This is real. It's all about him. This camera doesn't go off and I turn off this persona. Anybody who knows me knows this is how I operate every single day. Behind the scenes, behind closed doors, I'm living exactly what I'm preaching. I'm living it. I'm living it. And that's what we're called to do. Live such good lives that they will be, that they will see the good things that you do and will give glory to God on the day when Jesus Christ comes. The next part is talking about yielding to authority, following Christ's example. Now, I can't breeze past this. Verse 19 says this. I wanted to close, but we're not. We can't close. I'm sweating, man. Verse 19 says, a person might have to suffer even when it's unfair. All right? But if he thinks of God and stands the pain, God is pleased. So a person might have to suffer even when it's unfair. Everybody, anybody ever felt like the things that they're going through are unfair? Why me? Why do I have to deal with this? Anybody ever felt like that? Yeah, probably everybody. So that's kind of a funny thing to think about. If you think that you've gone through something unfair and that you're the only one dealing with that, but everybody on here, over 500 people raised their hand, that means there's 500 people who think that life's unfair and that they've had to deal with something that they didn't deserve. And so it wasn't personal, it was life, right? So if there was only one person on here and was like, man, you know, I, I went through this and it was unfair and, uh, and everybody's like, man, that sucks, then maybe it was personal. But the fact of the matter is that everybody on here has gone through something or experienced something that was unfair, whether it was grief, whether it was tragedy, whether it was betrayal, whether it was hurt, whether it was heartbreak, whether it was loss. I don't know what it is. It might have seemed unfair, but there's 575 people on here. And I can tell you that they probably at some point or some juncture felt like it was unfair, right? So it's not personal. That's life, you guys. Understand that. You're not in this alone. Everybody's going through something. It just varies by degree. But the scripture says a person might have to suffer even when it's unfair. But, here's the but, if he thinks of God and stands the pain, God is pleased. So although you might be going through something that's unfair, that's hard, that doesn't seem like, why am I going through this? If right? You think of God and you withstand the pain. You hold on tight. You draw near to him. You stay in prayer. You find a position of praise and you praise him through the storm. It pleases God. Here's something that, that it's, it's funny. He says, if you were beaten for doing wrong, there's no reason to praise you for being patient in your punishment, right? If I, poor, if I chose a, a poor relationship, I ignored all the red flags, the warning of the Holy Spirit, the counsel of others, and I got in this relationship that completely failed. Now my little heart's broken and I'm going through all my feelings, right? Why would we feel bad for you? That is the discipline. That the discipline. That is the consequences of your own poor choices and decisions, right? Many times we're over here like, God, why did you take us? Why are you taking us through this trial? And he's like, you ignored everything that I said. You put yourself in this position. You chose to ignore my word. You chose to ignore the counsel, every red flag that I showed you. You were so dead set on having things your way. This isn't a trial that I'm putting you through. This is the consequences of your poor decisions. We're so quick to be like, oh, God's got me going through a tough season. No, homie, that's the season you put yourself in because you ignored everything. He, he had a whole different plan and direction for you, but you chose not to listen. And now you're in the middle of a storm, right? So, so it says, if you're beaten for doing wrong, there's no reason to praise you. We're not going to give you a pat on the back or an attaboy because you're experiencing the consequences of your own poor decisions. If anything, it's just like, hey, we're going to pray for you, man. You're going to get through this. God's discipline doesn't last forever. The consequences of your poor decisions and choices and actions, it's not going to be forever. You probably need to learn this lesson. Take heed. Remind yourself that this isn't God doing this to you. This is you doing this to you. You feel me? Next verse says, but if you suffer for doing good and you are patient, then it pleases God. Sometimes there are things that you're going through that are unfair. Sometimes life does happen. And in those moments, hold tight to God. Trust God. Draw near to him. Hold on to him. Understand. And in, in those moments, we can pat you on the back. We can you know, encourage you. Right? God's pleased in that. Verse 21, it said, this is what you were called to do. Listen, Christians. If you think that life is supposed to be easy and, you know, comfortable and 
filled with just ease and pleasure and rainbows, right? This is what you were called to do because Christ suffered for you and gave you an example to follow. So you should do as he did. So Christ suffered. We're here to do the same thing. Not just live a life filled with suffering, but to hold close and stick tight to God, just like Christ did. So when we're enduring suffering, uh, unfair suffering, um, we're supposed to stay close to God. It says, Christ never sinned. He never lied. People insulted him. He did not insult them in return. Right? How many of us do that? As soon as somebody steps on my toes, man, I'm stepping right back. I try not to. I'm trying not to because I'm a work in progress. Uh, and you guys would be proud of me because I didn't yesterday. Um, that's a whole nother story we don't got time for. I don't even want to get into that. But um, Christ suffered, but he did not threaten. He let God, the one who judges rightly, take care of him. Christ carried our sins in his body. This is good news on the cross. So we would stop living for sin and start living for what is right. This is the last thing I want to say, and we're going to close in prayer. It says, and you are healed because of his wounds. It doesn't say that you will be healed, that you're going to be healed, that you might be healed, that there's a potential for healing. Understand that it's finished. You are healed because of his wounds. Verse 25, you were like sheep that wandered away, but now you have come back to the shepherd and protector of your souls. There's the, the, the verbiage that's being used is that it is finished. You are healed. You were like sheep, but now you are found. Do you guys get this? Do you guys understand? You are healed. You were like sheep. Now you're found. You've been, you've been taken care of. You've been paid for. It's written. It's done. It's over. Start walking in that. Start walking it as if it's a truth, not something that's going to happen. Christ tore the veil, right? We have access to God. We can experience the love, the presence, the, 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 we can experience God now. It's not something that's off in the future in this distance, distant place. That's the beauty of salvation. Salvation starts the moment that you put your faith in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. That's the beginning. So many of us are looking as if the second coming of Christ is when it all starts, but it started the moment you put your faith in him. You now tapped into a power that's supernatural, that defies logic. You now have the power that's in you that's greater than the power in this world. Before we had that power, we were slaves to this world. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to temptation. We were slaves to all of our feelings and our emotions, and we chased and went around after the things that our flesh desired. Do you guys understand that? We have access now. Now. I'm done. I'm complete. I got to get out of here. I want to pray. A lot of food for thought. I might watch, you might want to watch this one again. You might want to fast forward to the Genesis part and jump right into 1 Peter. There's a lot to digest. But I'll, I'll tell you this, Christians, I'm calling you higher, man. I might not be the pastor for you. Um, because I'm not going to make bones about it. The calling on my life is clear. And what God has put on my heart is clear. Um, I love you. I care about you. And because I do, I want you to be who God called you to be. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat. I'm not going to keep giving you guys spiritual infamil. Uh, you might want to go to a, a, a triple-A ball club before you come up to the big leagues because the direction that we're going, um, I'm calling you higher. You can walk around in discouragement for a brief moment around me, but after that, we're going higher, man. I might not be the one for you because I, I, I want, I'm, I'm calling truth. I'm not going to sit there with you and co-sign your stuff. I'm not the one. I'm not the one. Um, and, and I'm saying this with love and with truth. There is a sense of urgency that, that we all have to be operating with. And if you're, if you have made the choice and decide to stay down here and, and stay on a level, uh, that you're moved constantly by your feelings and your emotions, and you're allowing those things to dictate your actions and you refuse to hold on to truth. You refuse to get the help that you need. You refuse to move forward and to start walking in the boldness and authority that God's called you to be. I won't sit in that place with you. I'll minister to you. I'll love you, right? I'll grab your hand, but I'm pulling you higher, right? I'm pulling you higher because that's what I feel God put on my heart, my heart. So I love you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. 
uh, we pray that your word would move us, God. We're not just here for motivation. Motivation lights the fire, God, but we have to understand that it is up to us to continue to feed the fire. Lord, we need you. We can't do this without you. We're here because we need Jesus. Our hope, our faith, our trust is not in man. It's not in a pastor. It's not in a preacher. It's not in a platform. It's in Jesus. Jesus will not fail us. Jesus will not let us down. Jesus won't show up late. Jesus is always here and on time. That's who we need. We don't need another series. We don't need another message. We don't need hands to be laid on us. We know who we are because of what Jesus did. God, help us to start walking in the identity that you have called us to because of what he did. It's finished. It's finished. We don't need another, like, Lord, we need you. We need you. Be with us today. Lead us and guide us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The last thing I want to say as you guys get ready to dip out of here is, is just that we've become addicted to prayer. The late, like, oh, I need prayer for this. I need prayer for that. I need prayer for this. I need you to lay hands on me for this. I need you to put the oil. No, what, what we, need, we need to start. What, sometimes you don't need prayer. Sometimes you need discipline, right? Sometimes you don't need prayer. You need obedience. Sometimes you don't need prayer. You need to pull your head out and start understanding. Sometimes you need to open your Bible. Not every, like, I love prayer. I'm not against prayer. I'm for prayer. Bring all your prayer requests. I love that. I love that. I love that. But but at some point, you have to start being accountable for your own actions. And sometimes that prayer isn't going to, you've become addicted to asking for prayer. I need prayer for this. I need prayer for that. I need prayer for that. No, bro, you need to be obedient. You need to be disciplined. You need to be consistent. Sometimes you don't need me to lay hands on you, or maybe you do in a, a, another sense. You need me to shake some sense into you. Maybe it's not me just laying, maybe sometimes it's more than what you, I don't know. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I got to get out of here. Anyway, I love you guys. I'm trying to get out of here, but God's just like, let's go. Like, come on, man. Ah, I want you guys to see yourselves as Jesus sees you. I want you guys to get it, man. And I want you guys to run with me in the same direction. We're doing things for the Lord. <sighs> Sheesh. You guys have a good day. I'll see y'all back here tomorrow.